Aloha, everybody, and welcome to our Undoing Radio. I am Jeremy Vaney, and this week's episode is in the vein of Vaney, in the vein of uh, scenery from a life, the pathless path at ourundoing.com. That is a writing path. It's essays. And here on this podcast, as I keep repeating weekly, uh, I'm going to be doing these episodes in the vein of those writing paths. So scenery from a life is uh, using myself as guinea pig or just, you know, s- stories from my life to illuminate something that hopefully translates into you- your life, uh, gets to something universal, gets to maybe even that big aha wake up moment for you. Um, presses at it anyway. I'm not saying I can wake you up. Of course not. No one can wake you up including you. But if you can see and understand uh, who you are so thoroughly as a blockage to wholeness, uh, that blockage disappears. When you see your problems and the things that we call my problems, my psychological baggage, not as my, not as baggage, but as actually who you are, When you see the truth, when you come to understand these problems that are you, the problems clear up. Who's left? There's great joy in who's left. And spoiler alert, it ain't you. At least not you as blockage, not you as as partial self in the way, as the controlling factor blocking out one's whole nature. You're the whole shebang at that point. But don't take my word for it, because to do that is to just incorporate it into your defense mechanism, to incorporate it into your dream. It's to keep you asleep. So don't believe anything I say. Don't disbelieve anything I say. Just simply hear it. And now, story time. And since we just came off a three-parter with Tiokas and Ghost Horse... How fitting that this uh, starts off with him, thanks to him, me having my own aha moment. I still have them. This is one of mine, and this is the story of why I still have them. Me buddy, me pal, me friend, Teokas and Ghost Horse, likes to delineate between living with Earth and living on Earth. And I get that intellectually. And I want to put that into action. Because I get it intellectually, I want to do something about it. I want to live with Earth. Because it makes sense. And so I farm. And so I ask the trees. I ask nature, what do you need of me? I observe the plants. I watch where they grow. I watch companion plants. What likes to grow with each other? I look at these things. And I try to serve the yard (laughs) as best I can. I look at all the birds. It's practically a bird sanctuary. Um, So it's not a question of what can I do to help these birds. It's what should I not do so that these birds stick around? What are they doing? What are they like? What are they attracted to so I don't take that away or alter it in any way? I want to live with Earth. I know what that means. I get it. And yet something feels hollow. Something rings untrue in everything that I'm doing. When I'm trying to live with Earth, when I'm trying to do these things, perform right actions, I only feel it sometimes. And I can change my mind. When it's convenient for me, when I'm feeling lazy, when weeding is too difficult. And I look at these animals, I look at our ducks, and I... I see the joy, the just sheer joy that they have of running around and just being. We would say being free, but really they're not free. They're just being. It's us who are in chains. And so we look at that and see freedom. We see what we aren't. But that's just their state of isness. Is this what we call freedom? That's who they are. And it's the same for every animal I've ever seen. It's the same for the stray pigs. 
that we yell, go get out of our yard because we can't have them just rubbing tusks against trees and destroying trees and eating everything and maybe uprooting our water lines. Like we can't have all of that. Right. And so we've got to yell at them. We've got to get them out of the yard. These, these wild boars, but even still watching them run, watching how they are, how they act, how they react. It's that same sense of joy. There's that same aliveness to them. They're with earth. We have two cats and Oscar every single morning. Oh, man. Does he ever love that sunrise? <laughs> he comes and gets me. He wakes me up. Mew. Mew. He click clops into the room. T -t -t -t. Mew. 530 in the morning. Mew. And then when I don't stir, he jumps up onto the bed. Mew. Mew. And when I still don't stir, he nuzzles me with his nose. He tries to pry my head off the pillow with his snout. <laughs> uh, and if I still don't stir, he jumps off the bed. He runs into the other room. Meow! And he screams because he wants me out there. He wants to eat food. He wants my lap. And he wants to stare at birds out the window from the lap. And he wants to look at me. And he wants to smile. And he wants to purr. This is his morning ritual. And if I'm late... <laughs> there's a problem. Uh, and the real problem is that he may just start drinking a ton of water until he throws up. So I kind of have to get up. <laughs> I kind of have to enjoy Sunrise with Oscar. Next time on Sunrise with Oscar. But this is it. Every morning for this cat is a revelation. Every morning for every animal is a revelation. It's like, wow, in the new day, let's go, let's go, ah. We're up. Such joy. Let us out. For those animals that are trapped in pens, Oscar is a house cat, so he's never leaving. Doesn't seem to want to leave, which is good, because I don't think he'd do so well out there. But the trade-off is I better get up or else. Bird TV is on. So we look at this, and I, I, I wouldn't say there's jealousy so much as a pang of longing. Ah, oh, these animals, they're in it. They're with Earth. And every now and then, I'll go out, and the atmosphere will be just perfect, and the sun will be just the way it resonates with my body, where I'm not sweating, and but it feels great. And every cell of me feels as though it's alive and, and enjoyment of its own being. You ever get that, you know, and it doesn't have to be in the sun for you. It could just be anything. It could be you just wake up and you're like, ah, that great sigh of just being alive for some reason, even if your life sucks every now and then, right? There's that moment of ah, just being almost caught off guard by your own sense of aliveness. And as I watched the pigs running away this morning, <laughs> I was yelling at them to you gotta go. It struck me that that moment is being with Earth. That is the interconnecting nature that I can't get to rationally. It comes in fits and starts because I live in such a blinders world, you know, to block out so much of reality to exist in this separate self sense that I experience it as experiences, as intervals. It comes upon me and I can't chase it. I wake up with it. Sometimes, not always. It's just life hits you. And in a good way. And this is what it means when we talk about to know something so deeply that you completely understand it and you have such clarity that that clarity becomes you. It's not something you can get, get at by getting it intellectually. I can listen to Teokasin talk about being with Earth, not on Earth, and I can comprehend it. I can listen to it, and I can comprehend it so well that I do the quote-unquote right things as a result. I try to change my behavior as a result, but it, I'm still not finding myself in tune on a deep level level that is beyond the intellect or even beyond the emotional because I can feel something about it, but I'm not changed. I'm not changed by it. I'm not changing with it. 
even though I want to be, and even though I feel it. And you know what it is in those moments, those moments that come upon you that you don't call for. I mean, I had never thought about them that way before. I'd never inquired into, I'd just taken for granted, not even taken for granted. I'd just been unconscious. You know, these moments come and go. You feel great for some reason. You wake up feeling happy or feeling joy or feeling, but that full bodied in the moment joy and it comes and goes. But that, that is to say that we come and go as we get bogged back down into our mental clutter, into the stuff we have to do, into the details, into our lives, into our post-it note full of chores, whatever it is. We come back to our prison. We come back to our sense of not being free, not being fully alive. Not being with, but on. And if you're wondering, hey, Jer, but aren't you the guy who had the big oneness experience? Didn't you have the I am? Didn't you die to the sense of self and then resurrect as self 2.0, blah, blah, blah? Isn't that you? Yeah. And I'm also here in duality. (laughs) I'm also uh, self 2.0 means self still means I don't have to do the same transitioning you may, but that doesn't mean I'm at the end of my road. And let this be a lesson to never believe anyone who says that they are. Anyone who says that they've had a big enlightenment experience or whatever, whether they have or not, they may have. But if, if they believe that they can smile their way through life, while explaining great transcendental wisdom, um, which they can. But if they say that that means that they're still in it, they're still there in that timeless moment, that, that now moment, they're lying to themselves and therefore lying to you. That doesn't mean they're bad people. That doesn't mean they don't have wisdom. That doesn't mean... They didn't experience what they experienced. Simply means they're not experiencing it right now. Not fully. They may be half awake, but as I am fond of saying, one eye open is still half asleep. And that's how we exist here in this world. Until we don't. And such a person would have nothing to communicate with you directly. Because... What could you understand that would be useful? What could I understand that would be useful? There's only ever the waking up. To tell you woke things while you're still waking up is to keep the dream going, keep the sleep going. I mean, if what we need is to wake up ourselves, to have someone else just talking to us from an awake state is to incorporate that speech into our dream. And we could very easily think we're waking up because of that voice, but then we just wake up into another dream. And then we wake up into another dream and into another dream. The only way to not keep that cycle going is to realize that you're listening to another voice, not to stop listening, not to deny the voice and say, I'm going to resist this voice. Then you're just going to end up, you're still asleep doing that, right? You're going to end up in another dream or nightmare, but acknowledge Oh, I mean, this is how you wake up. This is how you become lucid in a dream, right? Is to wake up and do it and go, oh, wait a minute. Right. I'm dreaming. That other voice, that's telling me something. And then maybe, maybe you have a shot at waking up. I'm going, huh, I got to actually wake up, wake up. Anyway, even in the land of the half-awake people, aha moments abound. I suppose if I came from a heart culture like Tiokasin, um, I wouldn't need this aha moment. I would be living with Earth, not on Earth. And um, what does it do for me? Well, it, I guess you could say it fills out my character. <laughs> I mean, I don't need this as a stepping stone into waking up out of myself. I've already done that. 
Um, and I can't relive that moment. I can't get there through the same means. That would be dying into a memory, which isn't dying at all. So I would just resurrect as myself. It'd be like if you held your breath underwater for a really long time and then surfaced and said, ah, I drowned and came back to life. No, you just held your breath for a really long time. There's a difference. There's a continuity of consciousness. Never got broken up. The self never went anywhere. Its surroundings changed. It felt more pressure. Maybe it didn't feel good. And maybe this feels uh, like a relief being able to breathe again. But that's not the same as having drowned and come back to life. So here I am back alive. And what am I doing? Spinning my wheels? I hope not. My wife, Carol, and I were talking about how people ask us, so what are you doing in Hawaii? As though there's some pressure to do something. Like, I look at what have we done in Hawaii? I mean, for me, I came here and I started learning from nature. I started, which I didn't do in New York. Um, so one thing I did was learn from nature. I snorkeled an awful lot those first few years. Paid attention to plants and the volcanoes and all this. And really, really learned. Which you can see reflected in the Pathless Path, Lessons with Nature, right? I've written a lot of that out. Continue to write that out. At OurUndoing.com, cheap plug. Yes, still an advertisement after all, apparently. So that was part of it. And the other part was... Um, I had a, you know, a job as a cashier at a health food store. And virtually every evening, because I was living in Kona, which is famous for its sunsets, virtually every evening we would have a beautiful giant red ball of light going down over the ocean and really into the ocean. And, and every now and then there would be a green flash, the mythical green flash, right, as the final bit of sun leaves the horizon. And we would... All of us, we would stop the store, customers and us, service people alike, and go out onto the lanai of this store and watch the sunset and be like, wow, isn't this amazing? Look where we live. Look what is. Look what living is. Look what life is. This is insane. Um, clearly, we were not all from here, <laughs> you would think, except it's not true because Hawaiians also still love being in Hawaii, they still love Hawaii, they still, because they're living with many of them. They're not blocking out. And that sense of astonishment and wonderment, it doesn't leave you. It just resurrects every evening with the sunset. So I learned, uh, what did I do? I learned with nature, I learned just how conscious and alive and not at all different from us animals and plants are. And I learned to live in appreciation. Uh, I'd never appreciated anywhere I'd ever lived. I mean, wherever I came from, any city, any small town that I lived in as a kid, I was either indifferent to because I was too young or didn't like <laughs> at all growing up. Uh, the college towns didn't like, didn't care for, loved New York in one sense, but I didn't really appreciate it as a land, um, you know, on the level of nature. Uh, it's kind of hard to appreciate Manhattan from that point of view um, in a normal state of consciousness anyway, what we call a normal state. After I had... Um, the positive negation stuff uh, sort of brought me into heart. Uh, then I could see, then I could go back to Taunton, Massachusetts. I could go anywhere, any city, any small town that I thought was a crappy town or whatever. And I could see the natural beauty. I could, I could feel it, not, you know, just see it, but I mean, feel it. It felt vibrant and alive in its own way, even if it was sort of soul dead in other ways. There's still always something about it that like even just enjoying butterflies in the park, whatever it is. But I wouldn't say that that was an, living in appreciation with the place that I'm living. 
it was more like my prejudices had fallen away. The, the interval of thought, the thought constructs that stood between me and that which I was living in were gone. And so I could see their beauty anew, but I still wasn't living, I wouldn't say living in appreciation. So I would say for someone like me, what I'm doing is, uh, I mean, I, I don't have a heart culture to contextualize Jer 2.0 and, and give me validation and tell me what's going on. Um, and I'm certainly not seeking that at all. Uh, but I'm filling out. <laughs> I'm filling out as I grow older. I'm, fill- I'm understanding and living from these different points of view, from these different healthy senses of the world in which I live. And these senses of the world are senses that other people may already uh, be living in, may already understand. They don't need to move to Hawaii for that, right? And then, of course, what else are we doing? Oh, right, we got married. And so the, you know, what you, you could say the second half of our lives uh, kicks in now. We've got our own, you know, she gets whatever she gets out of Hawaii, plus there's now us. So as she would say, Carol would say, there's her life, my life, and our life, our lives together. So it's just interesting to look at it that way for me because I have been thinking about like, oh, right, what did we want to do? We had a mission. We had a goal, uh, you know, to sort of form a community center kind of thing or um, to bring speakers to the island, to bring people like Teokasin, to do talk stories, to have workshops, um, maybe even have a community farm. I don't know. These types of types of things are things that we've worked toward in some barely sketched out way, <laughs> but sort of seeing that we don't really want to do it even as we're doing them for various reasons. And I think maybe at some point we've felt a self-imposed pressure to do something. What are you doing? But when you look at it like, well, what have I done? I mean, there was this big life change. I moved to this island in the middle of nowhere. What, what, what's it been for so far? And I look at those things and I go, wow, that was actually important, informative, um, instructive. I mean, sure, we got to make money to exist here. That's the system part, right? Uh... But in the meantime, (laughs) we've gotten quite a bit. I'm not going to share with you what she's gotten. That's for her to share. But she's gotten quite a bit, too. We're finally living eye-opening lives. Living in astonishment at the world we find ourselves in. Wow. What a revelation. I never knew I could feel that way about a place, about me, about life in general. I mean, with the big transition to heart, wake up call kind of thing, you got that feeling, but it's not attached to anything. It's a total state of non-attachment initially. And I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. One is good, one is bad. I'm just saying these are different states of experiencing that. So now I'm experiencing it attached to this great teacher called Hawaii, which I then bring back to the mainland. Of course, not anymore because we're not going anywhere because, <laughs> you know, virus. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, before. <laughs> but anyway, that's just a little peek behind the curtain of yours truly's life. Aloha again, everybody. That little jingle means I'm coming to you much, much later, days later, a week later, something. Um, just to say this, just to edit this into the podcast, because if I don't ask, who will? Please, somebody, anybody, let me know you're alive out there. You could do that by however you're listening to this. iTunes would be the most helpful, I suppose, but really anywhere you're listening to this. Um, review it. 
give it a rating. Let people know that this show exists. Or write to me, jeremy at ourundoing.com, and just say, um, just tell me what you like and don't like about the show, or or just say hi. <laughs> not because I'm lonely. I just want to know that I'm not speaking into a vacuum. I mean, I could do that all day long. But uh, I get approximately zero feedback from this show, or at least I have so far, which doesn't match up with the amount of listeners uh, that I know I have from the stats thingy that my provider gives to me. So uh, I know this show is huge in Japan and Scandinavia. <laughs> I just don't know why. So write to me, Jeremy at our and Um And let me know that you're out there or like I said, review it, uh, write about it, get the word out there. So I know it's worth doing in the first place. I don't want to just do this for myself. I can talk to Tiokas in my own time. <laughs> I can ponder my experiences on my own time. All right, let me know. Thank you so much, and I do appreciate you listening. And I'd also appreciate hearing your experiences if you'd like to come on the show and share in the vein of this show. I mean, if, if you've listened to enough episodes and you think you get what's going on here and um, you want to chat, then yeah, definitely write to me, Jeremy, at OurUndoing.com. Okay, next week we'll be talking about the reality, the really real reality of kundalini aliveness. So look forward to that. I will see you then.